Now, it should come as no surprise to us that the exodus of the Hebrews begins in Exodus, uh, led by a man called Moses, who actually was a prophet. And what he's going to find is, uh, brothers and sisters, that, well, when we think about the Exodus, it really does cement the tone, doesn't it, of the deliverance of Israel. And we can take that theme and run with it all the way through the scriptures that, well, there's going to be a deliverance of the Gentiles. There's a deliverance out of sin, isn't there, from bondage. But, you know, Moses was going to find terrible disappointment with Israel. And we just read of those words there in Exodus chapter 32. He was a man who was rejected by his own people, was Moses. And in great despondency, he goes there on behalf of Israel to speak to God himself, who we believe is Michael the Archangel. Now, many years later, there was going to be another prophet and another man of Israel who was going to find exactly the same situation. His name was Elijah. And Elijah the prophet also was going to find terrible heartache in the children of Israel as they too were found not worshipping a molten calf, but worshipping, well, Baal, the god of the Canaanites. And it should come as no surprise to us, brothers and sisters, that when we look at the life of Elijah in terrible despondency and despair, where does he go to to flee from Israel? Well, it tells us in 1 Kings 19, he goes to the wilderness. Well, that's fascinating, isn't it? Because he's going to the very place where it all began many years before with a man called Moses. He's going right back to the origins of the story of Israel. And actually, we're given a little bit more detail as to where Elijah fled to. He didn't just go to the wilderness, brothers and sisters. Can anyone remember which particular place in the wilderness he went to? It was Mount Horeb. And Mount Horeb just so happens to be in the place of Sinai. And Mount Horeb just so happens to be the very place, the very mount, the very location in which Moses stood in the breach of Israel. And have a guess what, brothers and sisters? We've just read the words. In Exodus 32, Moses stood at the same mount years later Elijah was going to go to. He's resetting the clocks, isn't he? He wants to reverse time and go right back to where it all began with Israel and start afresh. How many times have we tried to do that, brothers and sisters? You know, start afresh. And we get that clean slate, don't we, from the Lord Jesus Christ when we beseech him in prayer. But this is a different tone with Elijah. He's going to reset the course of history or trying to reset the course of history because he feels Israel have become no better than what they were in the times of Moses. Time hasn't changed for Elijah, so he wants to go back in time to begin again. So, so with that in mind, we're going to just quickly fly through the two stories of Elijah and Moses. And it's actually beautiful, really, because, well, we, we, we know the stories of Moses and Elijah because they're famous stories, aren't they? Now, when we come to 1 Kings 18, and there's no need to turn there, brothers and sisters, because it's all, it's all on the slides, nice and easy. But when we come to 1 Kings 18, Elijah is told to go and greet Ahab, the king of Israel, and his wicked, sinister queen, Jezebel. And he goes to Samaria after being in a particular land. Where had Elijah spent the majority of his time prior to his arrival in Samaria? He'd been in Israel. But then he went all the way up north and he spent a bit of time with a widow, didn't he? And a son. In other words, Elijah had spent a long time in the land of the Gentiles. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, God comes to him and says, go to the king of Israel. What other man in the Bible spent a bit of time in the land of the Gentiles before the word of God came to him to go to a king? Well, I think it was Moses, wasn't it? Moses, too, spent a bit of time in the land of the Gentiles. In fact, he spent 40 years in the land of Midian before God came to him and says, go to the king of Egypt. And when Moses comes to the king of Egypt in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 10 to 11, well, Moses has a message, doesn't he? He has a message to the king of Egypt called Pharaoh, and he says to him, let my people go. And our children sing those words, don't they? One of the in one of the songs they sing. And I'm telling you, Moses wouldn't have sang those words. It would have been, let my people go. And we know the repercussions of this, because the more Moses asked of Pharaoh, the more Pharaoh hardened his heart, didn't he? And so when Elijah then, many years later, in the very same spirit, is told to go to the king of Israel, in many ways, Elijah too was saying to Ahab, let my people go. Go. And he was requesting for Ahab to unleash Israel from the clutches of Jezebel, his wicked queen. 
And the more Elijah requested this, well, the more Ahab, it says, provoked the Lord his God. In other words, in 1 Kings 16, verse 35 and 33, Ahab hardened his heart. Just like Pharaoh. Now, when Moses comes to Egypt and, well, Pharaoh hardened his heart, well, God says, I would smite the land with a curse. And, well, we begin the curses with one particular one in mind. It's to do with a river. As Moses turned the river Nile into blood, didn't he? In fact, the words we're told is in Exodus chapter 7 and verse 24, that the Egyptians tried to find water, but the water, it says, was cut off. In fact, it tells us that the Egyptians tried to dig for water, but the Egyptians couldn't find any water because there was no water provided. There was a drought, brothers and sisters, in the land of Egypt, a curse. What happened when Elijah came to the king of Israel and asked him to say, let my people go? What did Elijah say to Ahab? He says, I'm going to smite this land with a curse, didn't he? And can anyone remember what the curse was? There was going to be a drought. In fact, Elijah says, God is to close the heavens upon this land. And we can see, can't we, very quickly, if we follow the two stories chronologically, that they're both walking in the same spirit. Well, Moses was a hero of Elijah's. He was a titan of faith to him. And when, well, uh, Moses said to Pharaoh, I curse this land and the river turns to blood. Can anyone remember what Pharaoh did next? He, he got a group, didn't he, called the magicians. And with their magic tricks, they tried to conjure up something that could mimic a river turning to blood. But it was no hope. They were outmatched, outmaneuvered, outclassed altogether, weren't they? Who did Ahab bring to the table to help him fight the cause of Samaria against Yahweh, the God of Israel? He didn't bring the magicians, but he did bring the prophets of Baal, didn't he? And in like manner, they too were totally outmatched from the almighty God of the heavens, the prophets of Baal. Now, what was the thrust of Moses' message? Well, he met God first in a little cave in none other than the place of Horeb in the land of Midian, and there was a flickering fire, wasn't there? An unquenched fire that burned brightly, and there God spoke to Moses the prophet in the middle of the fire and asked him to go to the land of the Egyptians to request Israel to come out of its clutches. And before God even gives him the message, God gives a title for himself. And it's not, I will be whom I will be. It's something a little bit before. God says to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And he said those words in a fire, didn't he? What was to happen at Mount Carmel, by the way, with Elijah? What was to come down? What was to come down from heaven? Fire wasn't there. A divine fire was to come down on Mount Carmel. And do you know what Elijah said to bring the fire down? The exact words he said was, I call upon the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Israel. And so just as God answered Moses by a fire, so too God was to answer Elijah in a fire. And just as God had said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in a fire, so too Elijah was to request of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because Moses and Elijah both knew that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob answers in fire. And Elijah knew this. Oh, he knew the story of Moses like the back of his hand did Elijah because he's walking in the footsteps of the hero he so deeply loves. Now, when Israel came out of Egypt, something miraculous happened. There was another miracle, wasn't there? Moses put his rod, or Aaron's rod, into some water, and the Red Sea rent in two, didn't it? That's a tricky question, this, and it's a rhetorical one, but what was the exact wording of the parting of the Red Sea? The waters didn't just split, did they? Something came from the heavens that allowed the water to rend in two. It was an east wind. Thank you, Brother Andrew. And an east wind came and split the waters in two, and a blistering wind came, didn't it? Now, when Elijah called the fire of God from heaven, what was the next miracle? 
that was presented on Carmel that fateful day. A wind came and the rains poured upon the earth. And so just as Moses walked through the wind and the rain, so Elijah, it says, he didn't walk with you, brothers and sisters. Elijah didn't walk. He ran with all of his might. God was answering him in the very spirit of Moses. And Elijah, brothers and sisters, I truly believe it. He believed that he was leading a second exodus, not out of Egypt, but out of Samaria. And brothers and sisters, this man's heart is going to be utterly shattered. Because God has other ideas. The exodus has happened. And Elijah's got to learn this valuable lesson. If you look at one, if you've got your Bibles, brothers and sisters, handy. Let's just have a look at 1 Kings 18. And, and you'll notice that in 1 Kings verse 18, Elijah, you know, what a character he was and uh, what a man he was. He, he goes before Israel and, and, and there in utter confidence, utter boldness, he says to them, choose you a God. If you be on Baal's side, join Baal. If you be on Yahweh's side, join Yahweh. And then in verse 38, a flaming burst of fire descended from Mount Carmel from the heavens and licked up the sacrifice. Now, here is a mountain on fire in Mount Carmel. We have a mountain on fire in which we have a prophet going before Israel saying, choose you a God, obey the Lord. Now, many years prior, Moses was going to lead Israel to the foot of Mount Sinai. And on behalf of God, he was going to, be for, he was going to go before all of Israel and he was going to say to them, choose the Lord. And obey his voice. And behind him, towering above, was Sinai. Can anyone remember what Sinai looked like at that precise moment? It was on fire, brothers and sisters. Sinai was lit up by the flames of the Almighty. Sinai and Carmel are entwined together. In other words, when Elijah goes before Israel... Mount Carmel looked just like Mount Sinai centuries before. As he goes before Israel and says, choose you a God. Hope, brothers and sisters, he believes he's the second Moses. As he goes before Israel and the fire descends down from heaven. Now, before Moses goes up to Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 24, he does something really interesting. Once the children of Israel had agreed the covenant and they all said, we obey, to cement this deal, this transaction, this, this wager, in other words, what Moses did, he, he built an altar, didn't he? And, and can anyone remember how many pillars he placed around the altar? It was 12, because it says that one for each tribe of Israel. Now, before the fire of heaven came down in the times of Elijah, it tells us that he repaired an altar and had to guess how many stones he placed around it. What would you like it to be, brothers and sisters? Twelve stones. Each one marking the twelve tribes of Israel. And there Moses stood. For 40 days and 40 nights speaking to Michael. And Michael, the archangel of God, gave Moses the prophet the covenants, the testimonies, the judgments, the practices, the principles of how Israel were to worship. He was given the blueprint of the tabernacle, how the Levites would work, how the priests would ordain their ministry. And there was Moses in the heavenlies. But at the foot, something different was happening altogether, wasn't there? Because not long after, God was going to stop Moses in his tracks and he was going to say to Moses, get back down to the camp for the people of Israel have broken the covenant already. And Moses starts to saunter down, his aged prophet, on the way down, he's going to meet Joshua. And Joshua, the warrior, says to Moses, oh, there's a noise coming down from the base of the camp. It sounds like war, he says to Moses. And Moses' response says, that's not the sound of war, brother Joshua. That's the sound of music I hear. In fact, the words he says, Oh, that's the noise of music. So there was a great noise that was heard, wasn't there, at Sinai. 
what was being sung and what was the noise that was heard at the heights of Mount Carmel on the fateful day in which the fire came down from heaven. In fact, Elijah tells us, doesn't he? He calls out the prophets of Baal and he says, you make a noise. And what we find out is that the prophets of Baal were singing around a, around a, a god, a, a false deity. And in fact, it's the same word used. It's the same word used of Israel. That as Israel made a noise at the depths of Mount Carmel, so Israel made a noise at the heights of Mount Carmel. So the depths of Mount Sinai and the heights of Mount Carmel, it's the same word. Both groups were singing a song. And those two prophets now are going to be righteously angry, aren't they? Now, we know with Israel that they were worshipping a molten calf, weren't they? And the god in Elijah's time were worshipping the god Baal. Have a guess what form Baal was in. He was the calf and the bull god. In other words, Elijah saw them all dancing around and singing a molten Baal, a bull, a calf. Just as many years previously, Moses saw them dancing around a molten calf. And it's the same thing that's happening to Elijah. In fact, Elijah spurs them on, doesn't he? He says, cry aloud. And they all cried louder, responding to Elijah's jarring comments. And after the, the aftermath of this was, was a slaughter. Moses came down, didn't he? And he says, who is on the Lord's side? In fact, that's another hymn we sing, isn't it? And Moses definitely wouldn't have sung that. Who is on the Lord's side? And the Levites stood up. And they slaughtered those responsible at the foot of Mount Carmel. And Elijah then, years later, was to get the prophets of Baal. And at the river Kishon, he was to slaughter in like manner those prophets. And it just so happens to be, brothers and sisters, that the river Kishon is at the foot of Mount Carmel. A slaughter at the foot of two mountains. And now we can understand, can't we? why Elijah ran to the wilderness. Because he finds out after all this, that actually Israel hadn't changed, that Ahab hadn't changed, and actually Jezebel, more to the point, had still got her clutches on the hearts of Israel. The exodus hadn't happened that Elijah wanted so deeply. And so he feels it's only appropriate to go right back to the origins of the Exodus in the wilderness, more specifically to the mount in which it all began in Moses at Horeb, in 1 Kings chapter 19. In fact, if you've still got your Bible open at 1 Kings 18, if you just flick over to 1 Kings 19, you'll, you'll see there in 1 Kings 19 and verse 8 that he's traveling to Horeb. And, and it tells us specifically in that particular verse that he travels 40 days and 40 nights. And more specifically, it tells us that he neither ate or drank as he travels to the mount where Moses stood. Just out of interest, how many days and how many nights was Moses up at Mount Horeb? 40. And just out of interest, what did he eat or drink? Nothing. So Elijah here is doing the same thing, isn't he? They are inseparable, aren't they? Moses and Elijah, they are intrinsically linked together in the tapestry of the word. And Elijah now is traveling to Horeb because something happened in Horeb, which we've just read about in Exodus chapter 32. I think he has an agenda here, does Elijah? A real agenda because he wants to ask something of God that God once requested of Moses. There's something in the mind of Elijah at this precise moment about Mount Horeb that he desperately wants. We're going to find the answer, brothers and sisters, in Exodus 32. So, you know what? It might be easy to have one hand in Kings <laughs> and the other hand in Exodus 32. There's not too many toing and froing, but it just, it just might help. So... Uh, let's have a look. Exodus chapter 32. This is just after they'd worshipped the molten calf, and, and the Lord God now is furious with Israel. He's absolutely furious with them. And in verse 9 to 10, he's going to say to Moses, he says, and the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. 
And behold, now therefore let me alone with them, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee, Moses, a great nation. What a responsibility. I mean, we're talking about Yahweh, the God of Israel here, going to Moses and speaking to him through his angel and saying, I'm sick of Israel. I am fed up with them. They'd only left Egypt 50 days ago. <laughs> and he says, they're stiff-necked, they're stubborn, they're obstinate. Moses, let's start again. And I'll begin Israel with you. I'll make Israel out of you. I mean, this was momentous. I mean, imagine if the Lord Jesus Christ came to our ecclesias and says, I'm sick of them all. <laughs> But you I like. Let's start again. That's what's given to Moses right here. In other words, brothers and sisters, as far as God was concerned, and mark these words, Moses was the only one left. That's according to God. Now in Kings, in chapter 19 and verse 9, I'm going to pick up the story of Elijah. And you'll notice here that once he traveled 40 days and 40 nights, in verse 9, he's going to enter a cave. Now, I don't know what version you're reading, um, but where it says he entered at a cave, it shouldn't say a cave. In the Hebrew, it has the definite article before it. It should say, and Elijah came to the cave. Which cave do you think it was? This is the cave of Moses. This is the cave Moses once stood and spoke directly to Michael on behalf of Israel. And Elijah here, he knows not only his history, but he knows his geography. This is the sacred cave, the holy cave of God. And Elijah has this agenda. He's going right to the heart of Israel at Horeb. And he comes into the cave. And this is why God speaks to him in the form of a question. Remember, years before, in that very cave, God had said to Moses, I'm going to start again with you because you are the only one left. And centuries later, Elijah walks into that very cave and a voice comes to him. What doest thou here, Elijah? What is it about my character that brings you to this particular place? Out of all the areas in all the world, why do you find yourself in the middle of the desert, in the heart of the wilderness, in this one particular cave? What is it about the history of the cave, Elijah, that brings you here? And now Elijah, or the spirit of this man, brothers and sisters, if only we had more Elijahs. <laughs> he goes before God. And who might you think be who might you think be, would be representing God here in 1 Kings 19? It's Michael. It's the same angel waiting for him at Horeb. And who might you think the angel was that fed Elijah and said, Go, for the journey is too great? It was Michael there. And now Elijah rubbing his hands together goes before Michael and he says these words. I'm going to read, I'm going to say them in the words I think, using my imagination, that Elijah would have said them. And Elijah said, Ha! Huh, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. Notice here in verse 9, in verse 10, he uses the covenant name. Out of interest, where was the covenant name of God first revealed? In that very cave. He's reminding the angel of the wager, isn't he? I've been very jealous for the Lord God of Israel, the name. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, 
Where was the covenant first given out of interest? In that very cave. And not only have the children of Israel forsaken your covenant, but they have thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And here's the point, brothers and sisters. This is the point. This is where everything is building to. Behold, only I am left. They seek to take my life away. You know, only I am left. And centuries before, God had said to Moses, oh, there are stiff-necked people. They're obstinate, they're stubborn. Let's start again with you, Moses, for only you are left. And now, Elijah, what do you think he's asking of God? What do you think he wants God to do? Notice what it says there in verse 10, that he uses the name, the Lord of hosts. Now, the Lord of hosts, what title is that? It's not El Shaddai, is it? What title is the Lord of hosts? <coughs> the God of armies. He wants to bring the God of armies in righteous anger to come down to Israel and to destroy the lot of them. And I wage to you, brothers and sisters, and I'm making the strong suggestion that he's requesting of God, that he starts again with him. Only I am left. That promise you made to Moses many moons ago, God, he says, well, here I am. I want the same request. Start again with me. And what was it that Moses said of God when he was told the words that he would start again with him? How did Moses respond to those words? What was the spirit of Moses like? Well, in Exodus 32, verse 11, I'll read these words to you. He says to God, Father, relent your anger of them. He begs God with all of his heart, with all of his soul, and with all of his strength not to destroy Israel. In fact, he goes more to the point of saying in verse 32, look, if you can't forgive them, take my life. It was only reading those words, brothers and sisters, that I truly understood the power of Moses. He knew at this point the character of God, and he felt utterly unworthy to hold its mantle. The responsibility of starting again with him was way too great because he understood brothers and sisters, and yet he was a man of the law. He understood human nature. And he was absolutely right, you know, because we read in the, in, in the book of the Judges, in Judges 18, that Moses had a grandson. And the grandson of Moses was Jonathan. And you come to the end of the book of Judges, and Jonathan, the grandson of Moses, was the worst in Israel. If God had started again with him, in two generations, it would have been right back to the beginning. Moses understood human nature. He only knew, didn't he, Moses, that only one, only one could hand over the mantle, which was Christ, the seed of the woman. And Elijah, on the other hand, Start again with me. Make Israel out of me. And the irony is that the very words Moses was suggesting is the complete opposite of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it says in Luke that Jesus did not come to destroy the world, but to save it. And Moses had the spirit of Christ, didn't he? And so what we find is that when we compare these two together, what we see is that, well, Elijah says, I am the only one left. And Moses says, count them among me. Elijah says, they have sinned. And Moses says, pardon us from our sin. Elijah says, destroy them. And Moses says, refrain from their destruction. And whilst Moses was making intercession for Israel, Romans 11 tells us that Elijah was making intercession against Israel. Both had two completely different perspectives, didn't they? And I'll tell you what, brothers and sisters, we can easily at this point in this context utterly deride Elijah. And how dare we? We're talking about a titan of faith in which Hebrews describes that the world is not worthy. They have got two completely different perspectives on two opposite ends of the spectrum. You see, Moses 
was all about mercy, wasn't he? All about mercy. And what does God teach Moses all through his ministry? What's the great lesson of Moses, do you think? The lesson of Moses was to understand God's judgments. Have you noticed that about Moses' life? I don't know whether you have noticed it. It came to me just looking at this, and I was staggered at how many times in the life of Moses God was teaching him about judgments. Nadab, judgment. Abihu, judgment. The spies, judgment. Korah, judgment. Everything in Moses' life is, well, is all about judgment, and yet he was a man of mercy. In, in other words, he may have been shown, showing too much mercy in his life, and God was trying to teach him about the other side of God's character. Elijah, on the other hand, well, he's all about truth. Now, have you noticed everything about Elijah's life? God is trying to teach him about what? Mercy. The ravens, mercy. The widow, mercy. Her son, mercy. The 7,000 who yet not bow their knee to Baal, mercy. The prophet Obadiah, mercy. The prophets in the cave, mercy. Because Elijah was showing way too much character on the element of truth. And so God is trying to teach him about mercy through his life. And that was the point there in Exodus 32, where Moses has count them among me, God was teaching him about judgment. And that's why in 1 Kings 19, when, when Elijah stood in the same cave, in the same mount, God was teaching him about mercy. And it's fascinating, isn't it? Because can anyone remember which mountain, and there's a clue, that God revealed his name? What was the name of the mountain? Horeb, the very same mount, in which God in Exodus 34 says to Moses, I am the Lord God of mercy, of gracious, long-suffering, abundant, and goodness and truth. That was the name of God established at Mount Horeb. What do we notice about the beginning and the end of God's character? It's bookended by two characteristics, isn't it? The beginning of his name, it's all about mercy, like Moses. And at the end of his name, it's all about truth, like Elijah. And in between the name of God, or in between those two bookends, we have the character. Two ends of the spectrum both right in their own way. And brothers and sisters, our entire ecclesial body is built upon those two principles, aren't they? Our entire ecclesial makeup is built upon ecclesias that represent truth and other ecclesias might represent mercy. We may call them, brothers and sisters, liberal and conservative, which is political words, isn't it? We don't deal with politics. God describes them as being truth and mercy. And we could identify, couldn't we, those ecclesias, because they have their own characteristics. And we can look at it on a macro scale, and we can look at it on a micro scale. We might show in our lives certain characteristics of mercy, and others of us could be very truthful and judgmental, and righteous in our own way. And it tells me something that both ends of the spectrum aren't quite right. If we're showing too much truth and too little mercy, we've got it wrong. And if we're showing too much mercy and too little truth, we've got it wrong. We've got to try and meet in the middle, but we'll never get it right. There's only one man who showed truth and mercy perfectly. And his name is Jesus of Nazareth. Humor me with this question, brothers and sisters. When the Lord Jesus Christ was transfigured and he shone perfectly the character of God that we see there, who was standing either side of him? Moses and Elijah. The two bookends of God's character, mercy and truth, and there at the center of it all was the man who got it spot on, the Lord. You know, Psalm 85 tells us that mercy and truth have met together and have kissed one another. I just wonder, brothers and sisters, at the Mount of Transfiguration, whether or not those three men greeted each other with a holy kiss. For mercy and truth have kissed for the very first time at the Mount 
It's fascinating that it all took place at a mount, didn't it? You know, there was something more going on at Sinai, and particularly here at the Mount of Transfiguration, because, brothers and sisters, there was a conversation that took place that day, or I believe it was at night, actually. Those three men, those three great men, were having a conversation, and Luke tells us something specific about what they spoke about. He tells us that they spoke about his decease. That was the conversation on that night, was three disciples fell asleep. It was the crucifixion. And in that crucifixion, brothers and sisters, we have the definition of truth and mercy. Because flesh had to be crucified, didn't it? Truth. But in that, there was an escape. Redemption. Mercy. In other words, brothers and sisters, in a very long-winded way, at that evening, on that mount, Moses, Elijah, and the Lord spoke about how to save you and I. He spoke about us in the kingdom. And actually, when it says in Luke that they spoke about his decease, well, the Greek has a very different word. Because the actual word decease is the Greek word exodus. They spoke about an exodus. And what two better people to speak to about an exodus than Moses and Elijah together? What better people? Moses led a past exodus, didn't he? Out of the bondage of Egypt where he led hundreds of thousands of Israelites out of Egypt into the promised land. That was Moses. What of Elijah, brothers and sisters? How does the theme of the Exodus fit in Elijah's life? We only have to go to Malachi chapter 4 and we quickly figure out that Elijah is going to lead a future Exodus. All through his life, that's all he wanted to do, wasn't it? Was lead an Exodus. And prior to the return of Jesus, Elijah is going to be sent out to the four corners of the earth to bring Israel back to what they call home. Jerusalem. He's going to be Moses reborn. Moses in the past. Elijah in the future. And Jesus in the present. The three exoduses together on the Mount of Transfiguration. And they led a life of disappointment, didn't they? All three of them. All of them found themselves in the wilderness. All three of them were rejected by their own people. But Moses and Elijah, they became forerunners, didn't they? And they became forerunners for two people. Moses became a forerunner of a man called Joshua. And Elijah became a forerunner for a person called Elisha. And you know what? Joshua and Elisha have the same name. One is called Yah saves, and the other one is called Salvation of Yah. And if you get those two words, Elisha and Joshua together, well, and you, you figure out their names, you find out there's another man in Scripture who's named exactly the same way. Who else in the Bible is called Yah saves? His name is called Jesus. And how appropriate that those two men pass the baton on to two other men called Jesus, only then for the, on the Mount of Transfiguration to pass the baton on the second time to the man called Jesus. I don't know about you, but I think Moses' life and Elijah's life and all the highs and all the lows and all the despondencies and all the joys was all preparing them for that moment at the Mount of Transfiguration. Why wouldn't it be, brothers and sisters? The whole world hung in the balance. Jesus was in a time of crisis. And he rose up two men who'd gone through it all to encourage the master for the final three and a half months. What a conversation. What a thrill for them. All together. And there is Elijah saying, I am the only one left. And on that mount, he saw the only begotten one he knew right then that he was talking to mercy and truth together and just out of interest 
when Elijah comes to save Israel, where is he going to be sent from? Horeb. The very mount that Moses stood and the very mount that Elijah was stood. And Elijah is going to walk in the footsteps of his predecessor in the future. And how might you think the pharaohs of this world are going to react when a man like Elijah is going to come and redeem Israel? How might you think the Egypt of this world will respond to his request? Resistance. They will harden their hearts, brothers and sisters. And Daniel 12 tells us that a great troubling time will come upon Israel, that they will cry out to the Lord from the taskmasters of this world. And Elijah will be sent. And he'll be taken. And he will speak to the world, let my people go. And there it will begin, the second exodus, where Israel will walk through the wilderness of the nations together, not coming to the promised land, but coming to Jerusalem. And leading them will be a man called Elijah, the hero of faith, the next Moses. Thank you.